book of Genesis, before we start a new story and a new chapter, I want to finalize the Dukes of Edom, their names, just to clarify so that there is no confusion. So if you look at uh, Genesis chapter 36, verse uh, 40 through 43, uh, it gives a list of the names of the dukes of Edom. Now, the problem with this, like I mentioned to you before, is that some of these names are given from the earlier verses, if we were to look at, for example, verses 14 through 19, all right? Verses 14 through 19, if you look at those names and then compare that with verses 40 through 43, they don't really match. They don't really match. The thing about these names is that you would think verse 40 through 43 is repeating verses 14 through 19, but the problem is it's not really repeating because there are different names. Some of them you can notice the similar names with verses 14 through 19 and verse 40 through 43. You can see some of the same names mentioned, but other names that are not mentioned. Why is that? Remember, the reason why is this. It is strange for the author if he already mentioned the Dukes of Edom at verses 14 through 19 that he would mention the Dukes of Edom again in verses 40 through 43. All right, that would be weird for the same author to do that. The easy answer to this is that verses 14 through 19, notice it doesn't say Dukes of Edom, it says Dukes of Esau. Concentrating on Esau's genealogy, basically his family that came after him that became Dukes. But then verses 40 through 43 when you look at those verses, that's referring after what? After the incident in verse, uh, after the incident that occurred at verses 20 through, uh, let's say, verses 20 through 39. Verses 20 through 39. Because what has occurred in these verses 20 through 39 is that Seir, who was in charge of the land of Edom, it wasn't called Edom that time, okay? It was called Seir. You have to understand that. It was called Seir. So Esau took over Seir's territory, and then they both had a fight, and they conquered each other. When they conquered each other, the land of Seir became the land of Edom, and Esau's dukes that were mentioned at verses 14 through 19, some of them died, some of them have changed of positions. So that's the answer. That's the reason why verses 40 through 43, these dukes' names will have similarities but also differences with verses 14 through 19. Again, the reason why is because they went through a war with Seir, okay? They went through a war with Seir. That's why there were changes of positions with the dukes. And then also some names that just got eradicated. Okay, now that's the explanation for Genesis 36, verse 40 through 43. We are now, uh, I am going to give the meaning of their names as well, because I didn't do that last time, I believe. So let me give the meaning of their names in verses 40 through 43. If you want to write it down, then go ahead. Okay, Timnah was already mentioned before in Esau's genealogy, so we don't have to go through that one. Alva, so that's a new name. Alva means sublimity. Alva means sublimity. Jetheth, Jetheth, uh, his name means nail or subjugation. His name means nail or subjugation. Aholibama, well, everyone remember that name <laughs> pretty much. Uh, it was pretty commonly mentioned throughout Genesis 36 earlier, so we don't have to cover her name. Uh, we don't have to cover that person's name again. Elah, Elah means strength or oak. Elah means strength or oak. 
Another new name, Pinon. Pinon. His name means dark. Dark. All right, Kenaz was already mentioned. Teman was already mentioned in earlier verses. Mibzar is a new name. Mibzar means fortress or strong city. Mibzar means fortress or strong city. Magdil means prince or great one of God. Magdil means prince or great one of God. And then Iram, Iram means citizen. Iram means citizen. Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter 37, verse 1. Genesis 37, verse 1. Uh, we always have free Bibles in the pew, so feel free to uh, grab one of those black books or a free Bible. If you need one, one of our people can hand you over one. We're literally looking every single verse together, and I'm explaining every single word out of the verse. That's how you're going to learn from this Bible study. A lot of people mention that the Bible's too hard to understand, but what you're going to find out when you attend this class is, oh, the Bible's actually not that hard to understand as I explain every word from the verse, okay? So make sure it's very important that you look at the verse. If you look at the verse, then you're going to understand what I'm teaching and how I explain, okay? All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 37, and then uh, we'll read verse 1. The Bible says, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. Okay, what does that mean? It's, it's self-explanatory. Jacob lived in the land where his own father, whose name was Isaac, obviously, you might remember, his father Isaac resided, and he was a stranger in that land. The land that they uh, lived in is the land of Canaan. Remember, his father is not a permanent citizen in that land. He's a stranger. He's just an immigrant. He's just a traveler. So Jacob is continuing uh, in his father's stead. Verse 2, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. So verse 2 is explaining about the generations of Jacob, his family, his son. So it's about to begin the story of Jacob's children or his generations. Joseph is 17 years old. He was feeding uh, the sheep with his brothers. That's what verse 2 is saying. Continuing on, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. So uh, the young boy, that's the lad, Joseph, he was with Bilhah's sons and Zilpah's sons. You might recall those were the two, uh, those are the two names of uh, Jacob's concubines. So he's with their brothers, or their, he's, he's with Bilhah Zilpah's sons. They are his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. So Joseph, uh, being the little tattletale that he is, and you always hate those little brothers that always do that, would uh, tattletale uh, to his daddy, and bring up uh, the evil report of what his brothers did. So Joseph's, uh, you know, he's at that age, and he does something that uh, gets on his older brother's skin. Nothing gets on older, uh, eld older brother's skins or older uh, sibling skins than the younger sibling, you know, tattletaling on the parent, you know, about something bad that they done. Oh, they don't like that. And this becomes even worse at verse 3. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Okay, <laughs> that just makes things worse. So then Israel is also another name for Jacob, remember? So Jacob, who's the father, loved Joseph, the little tattletale, more than all his other brothers who are ratted out. Okay, <laughs> so what a wonderful start of a story, right? You can tell this is going to have a happy ending, all right? <laughs> Because he was the son of his old age. The reason why Joseph was more loved by his father is because Jacob was very much up in years. Being up in years, Joseph is the son of his old age. You might recall Joseph is one of the youngest sons that he has, next to Benjamin. Next to Benjamin, he would be the youngest son. So that's why Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. So because it points out that he loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, 
This might imply about simply giving a summary of an explanation that Jacob loved just Joseph more than all his boys. And this setting, verse 3, does not necessarily have to be uh, at the timing of after chapter 35 and chapter 36. In other words, Benjamin was not born yet. That's my bottom line. So you might recall that Benjamin, he was born at chapter 35, right? So chapter 37, verse 3, since it's pointing out Israel loved uh, Joseph more than all his children, it might be pointing out that this was before Benjamin was even born. Because you might recall that Jacob loved his uh, son Benjamin. So explanation one could be Benjamin was not born yet. So chapter 37, verse 3 is not in chronological order. The reason why is because of verse 2. Remember, it starts out, these are the generations of Jacob. So it's introducing the story about Jacob's sons, his generations. Why the timing could start anywhere, right? So you don't have to put Genesis chapter 37, verse 3 at a timing after Genesis chapter 35 when Benjamin was born. Or explanation number two, it could be easier than you think, is that uh, Jacob did love Joseph more than all his children, including Benjamin, because Joseph is the older brother of Benjamin, but they come from his, the favorite wife. See? So his favorite wife was Rachel, you might recall. Rachel only had two boys. They were Joseph and Benjamin. So uh, fathers, uh, during the Old Testament, they would tend to show more favoritism, uh, give more of their, uh, what they own, to the elder son, to the elder son of the wife that they loved. So that could also be the explanation, that he did love uh, Joseph more than all of his children, including Benjamin. All right, in verse, the second part of verse 3, and he made him a coat of many colors. So uh, Joseph was given a coat of many colors. That's, uh, during that time, you got to realize it wasn't easy to uh, create a coat that had many different colors in it. Uh, colors were very expensive during that time. Joseph was uh, a, little, uh, a little guy like him, was given that, except all of his older brothers. You think they like that? Oh, they hated him after that. Verse 4, And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. So when Joseph's brothers saw that their own dad loved Joseph more than all of the other brothers, they hated Joseph and they couldn't speak in peace with Joseph. Now, we're going to stop right here and then I'm going to show you some amazing comparisons. If you're going to name one character in the entire Bible that would match closely to Jesus Christ more than any other person, it is this person, Joseph. Joseph is the Bible character that matches Jesus Christ more than any other person in the Bible. There are probably over 100 uh, symbols or similarities you can find with Joseph and Jesus Christ. So I don't know how much of that is true, but I do know Arthur Pink, he has a commentary on Genesis, and he uh, claims to have found more than 100, I believe. So that's a lot. That's a lot, believe it or not. Uh, so Joseph is given that kind of honor to match Jesus Christ more than any other person in the Bible. It's also very interesting that uh, Joseph's uh, foster father was named Joseph, right? So that's kind of interesting. I wonder if the Lord deliberately choose it that way. Because Joseph would be the father, so to speak, of all the symbols that Jesus Christ would fulfill. So maybe that's something to think about. But anyway, let's begin here. That's why I wrote a lot over here. And we're going to look at a lot of Bible verses today. So I assure you, you will not be bored, all right? Or if you don't like Bible study, you will be bored turning to all these verses, all right? Let's look at... Many of these verses, and then we're going to see how the pictures match. First things first is verse 2. Notice that Joseph brought uh, unto his father uh, their evil report. Notice Jesus does the same thing in John chapter 7. Go to John chapter 7 and verse 7. You're going to write down a lot of verses, and we're going to compare them. Look at John chapter 7, and then we'll read verse 7.
John chapter 7, and then we'll read verse 7. Notice that Jesus Christ also mentioned that he would bring to his father uh, their evil report. John chapter 7 and verse 7, the Bible reads, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth. Okay, why? Because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. How about that? So notice that Joseph, he testified to his father the evil deeds that, uh, that his brothers did. Jesus Christ does the same with the world. And that's why Joseph's brother hate him. But that's why the world hates Jesus Christ. Yeah. Because he testifies the evil that they do. When they say they love Jesus Christ, they don't know who they're talking about. They're lying through their teeth. Uh, if they really met the real Jesus without knowing who he was, they would hate him automatically. They would hate him automatically. Okay, another one uh, from Genesis chapter 37. Uh, we find another similarity is that uh, Israel loved Joseph more than uh, others. Israel loved uh, Joseph above all of his children. Go to Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5. We'll go to Matthew chapter 17 and then verse 5. Notice how the Father's love is manifested above others. Matthew chapter 17, verse 5, the Bible says, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, see that, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. So notice right here that the father, instead of looking down at any other of his children, he pointed to Jesus Christ and said, This is my beloved son. Hear he him. So the Lord chose him as his beloved. Uh, a third example is they hated him and could not speak peaceably of him. So go to John chapter 15, verse 24. John chapter 15, and then we'll read verse 24. Look at John chapter 15 and verse 24. Notice that they could not speak peaceably of him because they hated him. John chapter 15, verse 24. The Bible says, and Jesus mentions, If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me, what? Without a cause. So notice that they hate him for no good reason. There's no good reason, justification. Uh, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. See, that's very unreasonable, okay, without a cause. All right, we're going to look at Genesis 37 again. Genesis 37. Notice right here that uh, the verse says in verse 3, he was the son of what? His old age, right? He was the son of his old age. Uh, one thing that we know about God, go to Revelation 1, Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. And then I want you to go to Micah 5, book of Micah, and then 5. He was the son of his old age. Jesus Christ is the son of God who is very old in age. He is from eternity. He is from eternity. So we see another similarity right there. All right, Revelation chapter 1. Notice in uh, verse 8, the Bible says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning... And the ending, saith the Lord. See that? So notice right here, God, his age is very, very old. Go to Micah chapter 5, verse 2. The Bible says, But thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of what? Old from everlasting. So that's Micah 5, 2. All right, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. So God's age is from of old. 
Notice right here, Joseph is the son of his old age. Jesus Christ is the son, and the verse mentions from of old. Let's look at uh, another thing at verse 5. Verse 5. And Joseph, uh, Genesis 37, obviously. Joseph and Joseph dreamed a dream and told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. That's self explanatory. Joseph dreamed a dream, and then he told his brothers, and when he told his brothers the dream, the brothers really hated him even more than before. Verse 6. Verse 6 says, And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. So uh, Joseph says uh, to his brothers, Hey, listen, here uh, I urge you, uh, the dream that I dream. For behold, we were binding, verse 7, For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheep arose and also stood upright. So Joseph is explaining his dream to them. He says, Lo and behold, uh, when we were binding the sheaves in the field, and note, uh, my sheaf rose up, and also it stood upright. So it was standing still, his sheaf. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. So their stack of hay, uh, the brothers' other sh uh, sheaves, or stack of hay, whatever you want to call it, that were, uh, that were bound together, they surrounded Joseph's stack of hay, or his uh, bound sheaf. And then what they did was they made obeisance to Joseph's sheaf. So then they bowed down to his sheaf. So Joseph said his sheaf stood up while his brother's sheaves, they all bowed down. Now, imagine a little, uh, little brat brother saying that to you. Who do you think you are? You know, of course you'll hate them more after that. I mean, imagine a little brother and then say, hey, let me tell you my dream. One day you're going to bow before me. And then you, <laughs> you just laugh at him, you know. Okay, then verse 8, and his brethren said to him, shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Of course, anyone would. So verse 8, his brothers uh, said to Joseph, are you really, are you really, are you truly indeed, that's the idea, going to rule over us? Or will you indeed, will you really have control, dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of the dreams that he had and because of the words that he said. I mean, it sounds show-offy, you know, his words, verse 7. Uh, verse 6, right? He's like, here, I pray you this dream. It sounds like he's like begging them, uh, let me show off something to you. No, we're not interested, you know. Verse 9, and he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren. Oh boy, here we go. The brothers are going to love this one. So Joseph dreamed another dream, and then he tells his brothers, and he said this, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. So Joseph said, Hey, lo and behold, what's going on over here is uh, I dreamed an, a dream again. So even more, I was dreaming even more. And lo and behold, I saw the sun, moon, and 11 stars bowing down to me, so made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him. Well, obviously, all right? <laughs> you might say, why? So when Joseph tells the dream to his father and to his brothers, the father rebukes Joseph, and he says this. This is the reason why. What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? So the, Jacob, the father, is saying, what's this dream that you dream? Am I and your mother and your brothers really going to come down to bow down ourselves to you? Is that what we're going to do? We're going to bow down, put our faces on the ground on the earth and bow down to you? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. So that's self-explanatory. The brothers, they envied Joseph. Uh, they coveted what he had, that he was going to get this uh, kind of honor. 
Uh, but the father, Jacob, he observed it. He was thinking about it because he knew uh, he was thinking that this dream can be of the Lord. This dream can be of God. Because remember, Jacob is a prophet, right? Which would explain his brothers getting envious. Because if they see this to be from God, then they would get very jealous of him. They would get very jealous of him. Now, uh, if you look at Genesis 37, verse 10, it defined and uh, told you who uh, the 11 stars, the sun and moon, should represent around a person. So let's look at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. The Roman Catholic Church has infamously used this passage to insist and to prove that uh, this woman is the Virgin Mary, but that is not true. That is not true. This woman is supposed to represent Israel. So let's look at Revelation chapter 12. It's supposed to represent the nation of Israel. It's not supposed to represent a singular Virgin Mary. Revelation chapter 12, and uh, notice right here, verse 1, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of what? Twelve stars. So twelve stars, moon under her feet, and the sun. Why, remember Genesis 37 explained to you what they were. The sun was supposed to represent Jacob. The moon is supposed to represent the mother. And the 12 stars are to represent the 12 boys, the 12 sons. I mean, look at Genesis 37 again, all right? Genesis 37, verse 9, Joseph says, Sun, moon, and 11 stars made obeisance to me. So Joseph, see, he's looking at the, ele he didn't say 12, he said 11, because he's not including himself here, all right? He says, the 11 stars obeyed me, see that? So, sun, moon, and stars, who are they? The father says at verse 10, shall I, see, thy mother, see, and thy brothers, see, the three categories right here, they match up. The sun, moon, and stars. Three categories. So there's no doubt that's supposed to represent the nation of Israel. That is not the Virgin Mary. That is not the Virgin Mary. Because uh, there's no doubt this is referring to the entire nation of Israel or the Jews. Because uh, how are you going to explain verse uh, 6, right? Uh, if you use verse 5 and verse 6, let's assume verse 5. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So let's say that's Jesus, the Virgin Mary's child, okay? After Jesus ascended to heaven, notice what happened after that, after that, verse 6. And the woman, supposedly Mary, fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Uh, no, that never happened to Mary. That don't make sense. Notice right here, uh, verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, Satan, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. That didn't happen. Satan uh, never landed on the earth and attacked Mary. Verse 15. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Since when did the Virgin Mary went through a little hurricane or drowned in a flood? Verse 16, And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. I don't recall reading that in any Catholic mythology even. I don't think they even have some kind of fable or story about the Virgin Mary with that, tied to that. It's pretty obvious. This is all referring to the book of Revelation. So that's the timeline of the tribulation. Makes more sense if this is referring to Jews. Right. Sometime in the future, the devil is going to persecute them. That makes sense. That makes sense. All right, let's go back. Genesis 37. Amen. Genesis 37. And then uh, we'll look at verse 11. Notice that his brothers envied him. So look at Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. Notice that Jesus Christ also uh, received envy. Jesus Christ also received envy. 
Look at Mark chapter 15. The Bible says in verse 10, For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him, Jesus, so they uh, delivered Jesus to be crucified, right? For envy. Notice right here, they envied Jesus Christ. So the brethren uh, envied him. Jesus' own brethren, his own people, fellow Jews, they envied him. Also, uh, go back to Genesis 37. Go back to Genesis 37. Notice that the brothers, uh, they asked him at verse 8, verse 8, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? So they questioned him. Are you really going to rule over us? So go to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. So they scoffed that. They mocked that. They questioned about, well, are you really going to reign over us? Go to Luke chapter 19, and then we'll read uh, verse 14. They will not let Jesus Christ reign over them. The brothers refused to let Joseph reign over them. Luke 19, 14. But his citizens hated him. So that's supposed to represent Jesus being hated by the citizens. And sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. Okay, go back to Genesis 37, Genesis 37. There's a lot of pictures here. There's a lot of pictures here. All right, we're going to look at verse 12. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. So uh, Joseph's brothers went out to feed uh, their own father's sheep in the land of Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. So uh, Israel, again, that's Jacob, Joseph's father. He says to Joseph, hey, uh, aren't your brothers feeding, taking care of the sheep in the land of Shechem? Uh, come over here, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you out to them. And he said to him, here am I. So Joseph, uh, he comes to Jacob, and then he says, here am I. That's usually common uh, when a person is summoned, then they'll go, I'm here. That's the idea. I'm here. Verse 14, and he said to him, go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks and bring me word again. So Jacob, he says to Joseph, hey, I want you to go and I pray you. So I'm making a request of you to see and check out whether everything is well and everything's all right with your brothers and everything is well, and everything is all right uh, with the sheep. And then I want you to bring me word again. I want you to come back, give me uh, the report again of their welfare. When we look at the next part of verse 14, so he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. So that's self-explanatory. Jacob sends Joseph out of the vale of Hebron. So that's where Jacob was residing, currently staying at, and... Uh, Joseph went to Shechem instead. Now in verse 15, And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? So there just happened to be somebody, uh, some man out there who found Joseph. <clears throat> and then, uh, uh, lo and behold, that's the idea about behold again. It's like, lo and behold, he's just wandering in the field. So then the man is uh, asking uh, Joseph, hey, what are you searching for? Verse 16, and he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. So Joseph answers that, hey, I'm looking, I'm searching for, I'm seeking for my brothers. Please tell me, that's what I pray thee means, it's to please, it's to request. Please tell me uh, where they're feeding their sheep. So hopefully that man would have an idea. Now before we come to that man's answer, notice we already see another typology right here. Is that uh, a lot. Uh, we see quite a few things here. The first thing that uh, we can notice is that one, uh, the son, Joseph, or you can picture Jesus Christ, he is seeking, he's searching. Two, he was summoned and sent to where? The flock. 
three, the sun is in the field. All right, let's look at all three, shall we? So we're going to look at all three. The first place is Matthew chapter 10, please. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter, we'll put 15, Matthew 15. Matthew chapter 15. Notice that Jesus Christ said that he was sent to the flock, to the sheep of Israel. All right, Matthew chapter 15. Notice that Jesus Christ, he mentions to the woman at verse 24, but he answered, verse 24, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So notice that Jesus said, I'm sent to the sheep, to the flock. Uh, in this case, it's Israel, the Jews that Jesus was sent for. Uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Notice that Jesus Christ, he gives a parable, and he mentions about being in the field. He mentions about being in the field. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 38. The Bible says the, uh, the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Okay, look at context of verse 37. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the who? Son of man. See, he's sowing the seed in the field. The field is the world and Jesus Christ is in the field. All right, go to Luke 19. Luke chapter 19. Uh, my advice is if you want to write all this down and not get lost, it's already written out for you. So write this ahead of time and all you have to do is just write the verse, okay? Uh, that way you can just write the verse and then uh, write next to it. It'll be that simple. Look at Luke chapter 19 and then we'll look at verse 10. Verse 10, notice again, uh, the typology of Christ is given. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Notice that the Son is searching. He is seeking. Go, go back to Genesis 37. Let's match it up again. Genesis 37 again. Let's match it up again. Verse 15, what seekest thou? See, the Son is seeking. Notice verse 15, he's wandering in the field. So the sun is in the field. Notice right here that at verse 13, the sun is sent to the flock. In verse 13, the sun is sent to the flock. Okay, now we're going to go to verse 17. Verse 17. And the man said, they are departed hence, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So... This certain stranger, this man, says to Joseph, uh, they left from here. That's the idea about hence, from here. They departed out of here. for I Because uh, I heard them uh, talking about going to Dothan. They said, let's go to Dothan. So the next part of verse 17, and Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. Self-explanatory, Joseph uh, goes after his brothers and then he finds them in Dothan. Verse 18, and verse 18, and when they saw him afar off, so when the brothers see Joseph far away, even before he came near unto them, even before Joseph uh, uh, arrived closely to them, was near to them, notice good older brothers, they conspired against him to slay him. Those are loving brothers, aren't they? Notice that Joseph's older brothers, they conspired together. They did a conspiracy. They plotted together to kill him. That's how much they hated him. They really hated him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. So the brothers were saying to each other, Look, look out there. Here comes a dreamer. Now, uh, we notice the picture, again, of how it matches in Luke chapter 20, verse 13. Luke chapter 20, verse 13. Look at the wording at Genesis 37. Again, the wording in Genesis 37 is, when the son is on his way 
to them, they plot to kill him. When the son, again, when the son is on his way uh, to them, they plot to kill him. All right, so let's move over to this side now. Let's move over to this side. Luke chapter 20. And then we'll read verse 13. The Bible says, Then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son, and maybe they will reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. So notice right here, when the son is on his way to visit the husbandmen, the son of the Lord of the vineyard is on his way to visit the husbandmen, they said, uh, hey, let's kill him. Okay, I'm not cut off, right? Okay. All right, please keep an eye on and let me know. Okay, look at Genesis 37 again. Genesis 37 again. Verse 20, verse 20. Come now, uh, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. So the brothers are saying to each other, Hey, come now. So that the idea is, hey, uh, gather yourselves together. Let's do this. What we're going to do is let's kill him and then we'll uh, throw him into some pit. And we will say some evil beast hath devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. What we're going to say after we throw him away in some pit, we're going to say, hey, some uh, dreadful animal, uh, ate up and kill our brother Joseph. And then let's see what becomes of his dreams. Let's see them coming true. All right. Verse 21, And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. Now Reuben's the oldest brother. The oldest brother, he, uh, verse 21, he hears it, and then he saved Joseph out of their bloody hands, out of getting killed from, from them. And then he says to them, don't kill him. Verse 22, and Reuben said unto them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness and lay no hand upon him that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. Okay, meaning that Reuben says to his brothers, hey, let's not shed any innocent blood. All right, let's not shed any blood today. Let's not spill blood. So let's just throw him into this pit that's in the middle of the wilderness here and Let's not, don't put a hand on him. Don't touch him. And the reason why Reuben said that is so that he can uh, get rid of Joseph away from their bloody hands. The idea is so that he can have Joseph escape from their, uh, from their, uh, from getting killed, from getting killed. And then he's going to deliver him to, uh, he's going to bring him to his, back to his father. He's going to bring Joseph back to his father. So notice again, we see the typology matching of uh, one of the son's brethren or one of Joseph's brethren uh, rescuing uh, him from the other brethren. We're going to look at John chapter 7, John chapter 7, look at John chapter 7. Notice right here that uh, one of Jesus' brethren delivers Jesus Christ from the hands from getting killed by his other Jewish brethren. Okay, look at John chapter 7. And then we'll look at verse, let's see right here. John chapter 7. And then we'll look at verse... 44, and some of them would have taken him, but no man, notice right here, laid hands on him. In other words, putting their hands on Jesus Christ. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto him, why have ye not brought him? So notice right here that the Jewish brethren, uh, they're upset at these officers for not laying their hands on Jesus. So they want to lay their hands on Jesus. Notice one of the Jewish brethren stands up for Jesus and defends him at verse 50. Verse 50, Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night being one of them, 
Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went unto his own house. So notice one of Jesus' Jewish brethren stood up for him against his other Jewish brethren. Let's go, let's go back to Genesis 37. Genesis 37. Now check this one out. Check this one out. Verse 23. And it came to pass, so that's self-explanatory. It's a metaphor pointing out. And just so it happened, when Joseph was come unto his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. So when Joseph uh, goes to his brothers, the brothers stripped Joseph out of his coat of many colors because they hated that coat. That was a special coat, expensive coat. They, they want to get rid of that coat. So they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. Verse 24, and they took him and cast him into a pit. So they took Joseph and threw him into a pit and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. So Joseph was thrown inside a pit. The pit uh, had no water in it, so it's an empty hole, all right? It's not a well of water. So there was no water in there, and Joseph was cast into a place where there is no water. Verse 25, and they sat down to eat bread, and they uh, lifted up their eyes and looked. Notice right here at verse 25, the brothers, after they stripped Joseph of his clothes, they sat down to eat uh, food, and uh, they all of a sudden, they just lifted up their eyes and looked. They saw something. All right, so in other words, they stripped Joseph of his clothes, and then they sat down and watched. Notice how this matches with the Lord Jesus Christ again. Notice how there are so many references that match with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to look at the book of Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Verse 28, Matthew 27, and then we'll look at verse 28. Notice that Jesus Christ, he was stripped of his clothes. And then the people sat and watched him. They watched him there. Look at Matthew chapter 27 and verse 28. The Bible says, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Notice right here. They stripped Jesus of his clothes. Uh, then you look at verse 31. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. So then they led him away to be crucified. Then look at verse 35, 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots. So they stripped him of his uh, clothes. Notice verse 36. And sitting down, they watched him there. So notice right here, they stripped Jesus of his clothes. They sat down and watched. Joseph was stripped of his clothes. They sat down and watched. Now, after seeing all of this, here's the thing. It's one thing to try to find similarities. I get that, all right? Yeah, people can try to find and search for coincidences and similarities. When you, when you get wording this close and you get this many in detail, let's be honest. And at the same time, if you believe God is the real author of this book, not man, then you're going to see right here, this is not just merely stretching things. This is something very divine. God, the author, he saw something in Genesis that Moses had no idea when he was writing in Genesis that I would even dare say that the gospel writer, writers, when they were writing, had no idea what God saw at Genesis. This was an author that saw from beginning to end, and you don't believe that book to be true after that. 
You don't believe that book to be true after that. This is not just, well, anyone could put up the sayings of Nostradamus or the Koran or the Mormon. No, 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 don't give me that, all right? Don't give me that. You can go to their prophecies. They are so abstract, you can pull up any prophetic interpretation. Sure, you can do the same thing with the Bible, but the interpretations, there's a difference with just stretching something that's abstract when comparing verse with verse with verse that clarifies it. It's not just, I can pull up any interpretation to match a verse. No, this is not just an interpretation where I match a verse. This is a verse interpreting another verse. Yes, yes. This is scriptural interpretation, scripture with scripture. This is not one verse, I pull up an interpretation. Yes. All right? People who argue about, well, interpretations are so vague, you can do that with any book. No, no, no. That tells me something. You never read your Bible. All right, people who say that did not read their Bible. I guarantee you that, all right? You ask them how many times they read through their Bible. I guarantee you they did not read it, okay? All right, uh, another thing right here. Notice that uh, Joseph uh, was in a place where there is no water, no water. And we know that the Lord and Savior, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was not given any water. Uh, I want you to look at... Uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew 27 again. We're going to go to the book of Matthew. And then uh, 27 again. Matthew chapter 27. And then verse 34, verse 34. They gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. Notice right here, Jesus refused to drink anything, and he couldn't even uh, drink water. Uh, notice right here in verse 48. Uh, verse 48, And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him, Jesus, to drink. Notice right here, Jesus Christ had no water to drink. So we see again matching up uh, with the story of Joseph. There's a lot. All right, now, this is very, very interesting. I, I'm very convinced that the author was looking ahead of something in this part. Look at Genesis 37. This is very interesting here. Genesis chapter 37. Uh, we're, we've left off at verse 25. So 25, remember, they sat down, they were eating, and then they lifted up their eyes. So the idea is they looked they, all of a sudden, they looked and saw something. What did they see? And behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. So lo and behold, what they saw was a group or a company of Ishmaelites. So you might recall that's Ishmael's children, his nation. They were coming all the way from Gilead. They were riding on camels, and they were bearing, so what they had was spicery and balm and myrrh. And they were going to carry it all the way down to Egypt. So they are on their way to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Notice the specific brother's name, Judah. Judah says to his brothers, Hey, uh, what profit? What, how, what kind of monetary gain? What a good brother, isn't he? That's messed up. What profit, what monetary gain are we going to get if we kill our brother and then we hide uh, his blood? Uh, come and let us sell it, verse 27, come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother and our flesh. Oh, he, he's acting so pious, yeah. No, he just wanted money. And his brethren were content. So notice right here, Judas says, come. So he's summoning his brothers. Hey, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites, and then let's not touch him, okay? Uh, because he is our brother after all. He is from our body, you know. Let's be good to him. Let's not kill him. Let's just sell him as a slave. <laughs> I, I don't know what's messed up in his head. So he, the, the remaining brothers, they were content with that answer. Man, they really hated Joseph. That is some hatred. They hated him that much. Now, uh, I want you to turn to Matthew 26, but keep your hand here, Matthew 26, but keep your hand here, okay? 
I want you to turn to Matthew 26 and read along with me at Genesis 37. Continue on, Genesis 37, 28. Genesis 37, 28. Then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. Okay, explaining every word, what this means is, so it, it just so happened what, what passed by the brothers were Midianites. They were Midianite merchantmen. And then they drew, so it's kind of like drawing out water, so it's an empty hole or well, right? But there's no water. So then they're uh, picking up, and they were lifting up Joseph from the pit, and then the brothers so, uh, sell Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and then the Midianites, or a.k.a. Ishmaelites, bring Joseph into Egypt. Notice right here that Judah sells Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. Judas sells Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. What's the coincidence? It's not just the close, close, uh, the near, the proximity of the names. That's not the point because if Judah is the same thing as Judas for some of you who didn't know that. Because Judas is from, you know, where we go from Hebrew to Greek translation. But this one is the Hebrew to English translation, Judah. So Judah and Judas is actually the same name. What are the odds? What do you think the author, you don't think the author was looking ahead and he saw something like that? That's crazy, isn't it? Go to Matthew uh, 27, Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 26, excuse me, Matthew chapter 26. And then we'll look at verse 14, verse 14. The Bible reads, notice, Judas. Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went into the chief priests and said unto them, what will he give me and I will deliver him unto you. See, like Judah, I'm going to deliver. Let's deliver the brother to you. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. So 30 pieces of silver. Out of all the exchange, out of all the exchange and currency and other minerals or rocks they could have used, it was silver. And then the closeness of the number as well, 20 with 30. Very close. This is extremely close. Go to Genesis 37. Genesis 37. Uh, verse 28, notice the problem here. So what's the problem here, Pastor? The supposed problem is, notice how the author was so stupid, so maybe he wasn't really paying attention, or our critics are the ones that are idiotic enough that the author would make a mistake in the same verse. Yeah. I tend to go with the latter. Okay, who's stupid to do that, all right? The author would obviously know, okay? He would have a meaning and intention with this. Why would verse 28, it would say that it's the Midianites who picked up Joseph, when it's supposed to be Ishmaelites. All right, it's obvious, all right? The critics are stupid. They don't know what they're talking about. There's a different meaning behind this. Go to Judges 8. Judges 8. You know, whenever these critics always try to pull up a contradiction in your Bible verse or a problem in your Bible verse, you got to realize this. You got to have a high skepticism of them. You got you to gotta be critical of those critics. You might say, why should I? The reason why is this, is that they're just randomly, nonchalantly, just fi finding verses and then finding anything that seems contradictory. Haven't they opened up to the possibility of maybe there's a deeper meaning here that I should look into yeah. before unfairly throwing out an accusation? Yeah. You do that in court. You, do, you don't just throw out accusations. Right. Well, maybe nowadays we do, right? You know? Yeah. Nowadays, we do. They just randomly throw accusations, and then some guy will have to go through uh, 50 different trials and court proceedings, maybe. That's the kind of world we live in. So I'm sorry. I didn't mean to call our world that stupid. They're more than stupid, actually, now that I think about it. They would do that. They would do that. They would just throw out accusations yep. randomly. So look at Judges 8. Look at Judges 8. Notice right here how uh, the Bible knows... And the Bible points out how the Midianites are interchangeable with the Ishmaelites. Now, some people might wonder, well, didn't Midian come one of Abraham's different wives, Keturah? 
uh, whereas Ishmael came from the other wife, Hagar. Wait, why silly? Have you ever thought about that the Midianites and the Ishmaelites all of a sudden bumped into each other? Then they intermingled and became one people? If you're an honest historian who studied genetics and, peop and different nations, you would know they all bumped into each other or mingled. I mean, di didn't we see that in Genesis 36 with Esau and Seir? Mm -hmm. yep. That's just common sense. Uh, people nowadays, they, they don't think about it. Look at verse 24, verse uh, 23. Uh, Actually, we'll start off at verse 22. Excuse me. We'll start off with verse 22. The Bible says, And the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you that ye would give me every man the earrings of his prey. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. Verse 26, And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold beside ornaments and collars and purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian. So notice right here that the earrings or the jewelry that they take off from their prey, it's all interchangeable with the Ishmaelites here. And their prey was the Midianites. That's just pretty common, okay? So don't be surprised if, uh, you know, you ever thought about this dummy in verse 28? It was both Midianites and Ishmaelites, okay? They just happened to travel together. Uh, that ain't a contradiction. Okay. Now we'll have to unfortunately end it here, all right? I'll give you the other details and types of Christ uh, next time. There's a lot more, all right? There's a lot more. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's Genesis study was a blessing to the people and that they grew more in knowledge of the scriptures and your word, understand more of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.